In this part of the lecture, I'd like to talk about a few additional issues that come up when people build tidal fets and that have been seen in some of the experimental results, and just kind of get a little bit of a summary of everything we've learned in this lecture. So one major problem that's shown up in many of the experimental results is that the tunneling is actually thermally activated. So what does that mean? So now if you notice, here's sort of the steepness at room temperature. And you know, as we cool it down, our device starts to get steeper and steeper. And in fact, if you now look at sort of how steep it is, the subthreshold swing versus temperature, what we can see is that the swing is directly proportional to the temperature, and it extrapolates down to zero. And so this is troubling, because what it's saying is that our device is following a thermal activation, which means that it's never going to be better than a MOSFET. And indeed, in these devices that show the thermal activation, they are all worse than MOSFETs, or worse than the sort of the thermal limit. And so this is just one device here that kind of shows this behavior. But it occurs in many different devices. For instance, here's another example, where again, you can see the device is getting much steeper with temperature, and it's proportional, and the swing is proportional to temperature. And same with this device. And again, it extrapolates back down to zero, kind of showing you that it's a very strong thermal dependence. So the question is, why are we seeing this? What's going on? And so what's happening is that in these devices, there's a huge number of traps. And so this could be from doping and those other inhomogeneity, and it could also be from interface traps. Because let's say you have a very high interface trap density, 10 to the 13 per centimeter squared. That's going to be very close to the actual density of states in your band. Say in a quantum model, you might also expect 10 to the 13 to 10 to the 14 per centimeter squared. But that means that you essentially have no well-defined band edge because you have traps throughout your whole band gap. And so then what happens is you tunnel directly to this trap state. But then the current can't conduct very well because these trap states are localized states. And so to conduct, the electron then needs to thermalize and get excited into the conduction band. And so then you have, so you, so you have this band edge, which is essentially defined as a mobility edge. And it just says, where do electrons start conducting? And kind of where do these states broaden into a continuum? We have now have a two-step process. First, you have to tunnel into a trap state, and then you get thermally excited out of that trap state. What happens is, whichever one of these rates dominates will then limit the current. So in some cases, what we'll see is that the tunneling rate is very slow. And so then we just see that means our current is directly reflecting either the density of states or the barrier thickness modulation. But in other cases, the tunneling rate can be relatively fast. Let's say if you have a heterojunction in a very thin barrier. Then what's going to happen is your thermal excitation rate is going to limit. And now this rate is just proportional to a Boltzmann factor. And so what that means is that as your, your turn-on is going to be directly thermal, it's just going to be based on how high this barrier is, which is going to change with the bias. And so unfortunately, we then see a thermal response, and we never see a sharp turn-on. And so now I want to take a little bit of a digression into a new measurement technique. And this would kind of allow us to get some new insights into some of the experimental data. So I want to consider a two-terminal measurement on a transistor, or on a tunneling field effect transistor. So the basic idea is that in a TFET, or we have our tunneling junction, say, between the P and the I. And then now our gate voltage typically controls the potential across that tunneling junction. And so what we, want, what we really want to know is, when we apply a voltage to this device, how does this potential change? And so now we can write sort of a capacitive equivalent circuit model. And this allows us to, to figure out what are the electrostatic potentials in the device. So our gate voltage is coupled through sort of a gate oxide and a gate capacitance here. Similarly, our source is going to impact the potential of this junction through a source capacitance, and same with the drain. And now this circuit model is different from sort of a typical resistive circuit model that you would draw for the Fermi levels. And the idea is that we want to know the voltage that's dropped across this junction, or what is the electrostatic potential across it. So that's equivalent to saying, what is the voltage across this capacitor? So there's two ways we can influence that voltage. One is that we could change the voltage on this gate directly. Or what we can also do is change this voltage down here. And so by the way I've connected these two power supplies, if I change this voltage, I'll change both the drain voltage and the voltage on the gate relative to the source. And so doing that actually allows me to get some, a measurement that's a little bit closer to the intrinsic performance of the device. Because first, let's just consider what happens if I only change the gate voltage. So by changing this voltage, I now have a capacitive voltage divider. 
And so the voltage across this capacitor, which is this voltage, is going to basically be given by the gate efficiency times the voltage that we applied. And so what we see is that that gate efficiency is just the gate capacitance divided by the sum of all three capacitances. Now, let's consider what happens when I change this voltage. In that case, since I'm changing both the voltage here and, by the way, it's connected, the voltage here, we actually have these CG plus CD over the sum of the three. And so what that means is that we're essentially getting a turn-on that's closer to the actual intrinsic steepness. This change is closer to the voltage that's applied VDS. So that's useful because that gives a little bit more of an accurate measurement. Now in practice, the CD is usually very small, and so these two end up being the same almost. What we'll see now is when we plot it this way, we can actually get a lot more information out. So first, let's kind of look at our standard transistor measurement. And here you're just plotting your current versus your voltage, your VGS, so your gate voltage. And you see your standard steepness. But what really what, what it means is that sort of our actual intrinsic steepness is going to be some gate efficiency times the measured steepness. Measured. Ideally, we want to get rid of that, and so now our two-terminal measurement is a little bit more a little bit more useful. So we can do exactly that. And so now what I've plotted is the conductance versus the drain voltage. And what you now you can do is you can look at sort of what is the steepness of these lines. And what you see is that they actually end up being very similar to what you get using just a MOSFET. So it's basically this steepness is the same as a subthreshold swing, typically. And so that's very interesting. And so what it says is that we now have a different way to measure the steepness of the device. And right now you would say, well, it doesn't matter how I change my gate to drain bias as I change my VDS, I'm more or less getting the same steepness everywhere. Or at least it'll all have the same peak steepness with it rolling off sort of at higher currents. But things start to get very interesting if we cool this down. So when I cool this device down, I see two very distinct regimes. Sort of here we see this really steep regime where it's around 25 millivolts per decade. So this is at 77 Kelvin. But now I also see sort of in the four bias regime and so that's one thing to note. Sort of this negative voltage corresponds to a forward biased diode, whereas a positive voltage corresponds to a negative biased diode. Forward and reverse. And what you can see here is in the forward biased regime, the steepness actually stays the same. Or it's a very small change from 108 to 100. So it's almost temperature independent in forward bias. While in reverse bias, we see this sharp temperature dependence. And indeed, that's sort of that same temperature dependence we saw in the MOSFET. Around 100, it's also around 20, or 77, is 25 millivolts per decade. So what it means is that we can learn something here, because now we have two different regimes in the same device. So what's going on? So let's look at what happens in forward bias tunneling. In forward bias tunneling, we, ha we still have a two-step process, but now our electron starts up in the conduction band. It gives off energy, and then it tunnels. But what this means is that since this is a process where you give off energy, you no longer have a Boltzmann factor. So it doesn't matter if I have a large barrier or a small barrier. We're going to have the same probability of dropping down. And so what this means is that this is always going to, it's very easy to drop down. And what's going to limit the current is the tunneling probability, or the tunneling density of states. This forward bias regime tells us the steepness of the tunneling. And that could be either barrier thickness modulation or density of state switching. But whichever it is, it's definitely controlled by the tunneling junction rather than a thermal process. Now, whereas we have the opposite that's going on in this reverse bias situation. Here, we have the two-step process where we have to gain thermal energy. And because of this, ener this ends up rate limiting at low temperatures. And so this is what controls the characteristics of the IV. And now things get even more interesting when we start looking at high temperature measurements. As we heat the device up, we notice firstly sort of in this forward bias regime, nothing much changes. It increases slightly, but basically from low temperature to high temperature, it's always been roughly constant. And that's because 
It's really the intrinsic steepness of the tunneling. And then that's not a temperature dependent process, or it has very weak temperature dependencies. But now what we also notice is that down here, where it was temperature dependent in reverse bias, this is no longer, it's losing its temperature dependence. It's basically saturated. And so what's happening is its thermal rate has now become very fast because we're at a high temperature, it's easy to thermalize. And so again, the tunneling rate now becomes limiting. And so this is very interesting because that's kind of supports the idea that we have these two processes going on in parallel. And then we can see the different regimes where they turn on. On the forward bias, it's always the actual tunneling, whereas in reverse bias, it switches. At low temperatures, we're thermally limited, but at higher temperatures, we start to be tunneling limited. And now what's unfortunate is that what this is really telling us is that our devices aren't very good. Because for this whole thing to work, we needed that huge density of interface traps. And so really what this comes down to is it's saying, until we get rid of these traps, we're never going to see a sharp turn-on. And that devices that show sharp turn-ons at low temperatures can't be trusted. Because at low temperature, is that steepness is due to a thermal process, which is never going to be better than a MOSFET. Now I want to mention sort of a different type of problem that can occur when trying to build a tunnel FET. And that's just that if you make your, what happens if you make your gate very, very short? For a very, very short gate, you're going to essentially have direct source to drain tunneling. And so this also limits conventional transistors. But the problem is that in the tunnel FET, we're trying to get a steepness that's better than 60 millivolts per decade. And so what that means is that this direct source to drain tunneling is going to become a problem at before it's a problem for a MOSFET. And so you can kind of see that here. With the long channel, it's very steep. And then as you shorten the channel length, you start to lose that steepness due to direct to source to drain tunneling. So it's just something to keep in mind that it's going to be harder to scale a tunnel FET because of that. Now another challenge that's really sort of, it's just a very practical issue, but it's killed a lot of experimental devices. And that's just that you can have poor electrostatics. So let's say you have some graded doping or your doping is non-uniform. What happens is you can have different regions of your device turning on at different biases. So, for instance, here's a simulation of an older structure of a pocket TFET. And the idea here is that you'd implant this M plus tocket and you could get a very sharp turn on and you get vertical tunneling. The problem is, if you didn't align these two edges perfectly, you would have different regions of the device turning on at different currents. And so you can kind of see that where you have a sharp turn on ideally, but now you misalign things and you get a very gradual turn on. And so, what it just, this is just like one example of where getting your electrostatics wrong even slightly can destroy the performance of the device. And so that's something that you need to be very careful about. All right, so now I'd like to kind of summarize everything that we've covered in this lecture. So what we've found is that if you want to get a sharp subthreshold swing at high currents, we really need a steep density of states. If you just try to control the thickness of the tunneling barrier, it's not going to work well at high current density. But now getting this sharp density of states is not easy. We really need to eliminate every single form of inhomogeneity. That means eliminating doping, interface traps. If you have quantum wells, you can't have any thickness fluctuations. We almost need like atomically perfect materials if we're going to get the steep density of states. So that's going to be a very large challenge. And so now one of the key things that we can do is sort of use gates to electrostatically control the Fermi level, because that at least eliminates all of the defects and inhomogeneity due to the random doping item, random doping ions. Now another thing we can do to get sort of the higher on currents in tunnel FETs is to try to take advantage of quantum confinement where we can. Because there, by squeezing our electrons, we can increase the conductance by 10 to 100x. And so if you put all of these together, hopefully we should be able to reduce our voltages to less than 100 millivolts and hopefully get a 10x reduction of voltage and a 100x reduction in power. All right, here are some review questions. So take a look at these, and then you may want to pause your video here because then I'm going to go through the questions and explain the answers. So now the first question is kind of where does the quantum of conductance come from? And so the quick explanation is that it comes from sort of the product of a density of states and a velocity. And then those two directly exactly cancel to give you a quantum of conductance that says that regardless of the energy, you have the same amount of current flowing in a unit energy. The next question is, if you want to get a sharp, good tunneling probability, do we want a light effective mass or a he heavy effective mass? 
And what about the barrier height? If you go back and look at the tunneling equation, what well you see is that we want a light effective mass. And then we also would want sort of a small barrier to make it easier to tunnel through. Next question is, kind of what happens to barrier thickness modulation at high tunneling probability and current densities? And so what happens there is that it starts to saturate. What that means is that our barrier thickness modulation doesn't work well at high current. And if you recall, we had sort of this formula that is the potential divided by the log of the tunneling probability. And so what that means is that at high tunneling probability, barrier thickness modulation doesn't work. It's only very steep at low tunneling probabilities. All right. Next question. And what effects can prevent a sharp density of states switching? And so for this, it's really any sort of inhomogeneity. So this could be doping atoms, it could be interface traps, it could be various defects, it could be thickness fluctuations in quantum wells, it could just be lateral inhomogeneity in the device. So there's a lot of different things that can ruin a sharp density of state switching. And so what it means is that we really need to focus on getting very good quality material, very uniform material, if we actually want to see these sharp turn-ons. And so the next question is, what are the advantages of quantum confinement in the tunneling direction? And so there's a couple advantages here. The first is that you can increase the conductance by a large amount, 10 to 100x. And that comes from two, that's for two reasons. The first is that as you confine, you increase your energy, which means that a high energy will correspond to a high velocity, which will correspond to more tunneling attempts and a higher current. In addition, as you sort of squeeze your electron into a narrower and narrower quantum well, the wave function starts to leak out, which increases your current more. And another benefit is if you have quantum confinement in the tunneling direction, you can reduce your overdrive voltage. That's to say that your device will turn on very quickly and have a sharp turn on sort of beyond threshold, where all your threshold behavior, or before threshold, is still determined by sort of that bandage steepness or your barrier thickness modulation. Okay, the next question is, what are the four factors that contribute to the subthreshold swing? And so now, two of the factors are the gate efficiencies. So you have an electrostatic gate efficiency, which means that you lose some voltage across your gate oxide. Then you also have a quantum confinement gate efficiency. So sort of, in devices that have a very narrow channels, you can have a quantum confined level that's shifting as you try to pull, it, pull the voltage down. And that'll fight against you. Now the other two factors are sort of the barrier thickness modulation and density of state switching. And now, whichever of those two mechanisms is steeper will give you the steeper turn on. And so you need to account for both of them. And then the last question is, what causes the thermal activation in the tunnel effect? And so now, again, this is sort of a, still an area under research, but it appears to be that there's really a two-step process that occurs when you're tunneling into a band tail state or into a defect state. And that's that you tunnel, and then you're thermally excited out. And if your tunneling rate is very high, you can then be limited by the thermal excitation rate, and you then see a thermal activation. All right, well now I'd like to go over a few references to kind of that you can read about some of these topics more. So first, here are a few review articles that sort of cover tunneling. So this book chapter that we wrote really explains kind of everything in this lecture in more detail. Now you can also look at some of the more conventional review articles and these ones really do a good job of explaining kind of how do you get higher current density, kind of how do you engineer heterostructures, but it doesn't, they don't really appreciate sort of the impact of the density of states. Now if you want to kind of learn a little bit more about the WKB tunneling, here are a couple good references for that. And now, for barrier thickness modulation and kind of why that doesn't work very well, this paper here, it explains sort of the full derivation of that barrier thickness modulation in the different regimes. And now this paper explains how to determine the steepness of a tunneling diode and then how that applies to a tunneling transistor. And so while it seems very simple, like you just look at the conductance instead of the current, there's actually still a fair bit of math to sort of actually prove that. And this goes through all that. And this paper here covers that PN junction dimensionality. Kind of why do we get a sharper turn on as we reduce the dimensionality? And lastly, this paper has the nice subthreshold swing model that we covered. And then it all, but its main focus is sort of just how to design the bilayer.
Thank you for listening to this lecture. In the next few lectures, you'll hear about other approaches for low-power electronics.